So thank you, Dr. Wata, for joining us for this first with this episode of the Footprint Projects. So based on the footprint, it's about sharing perspectives and experiences that you've gone through and how these has shaped your trajectory in terms of your professional development as a reflection to guide the young professional. So to start it off, maybe you could just tell us what your day-to-day -day experience as a clinical pharmacist at the KNH is. Over to you, Doc. Uh, thank, thank you, thank you, David, for this opportunity. So just looking at the day-to-day -day experience, uh, clinical pharmacy is very interesting, and especially in the space that I work in, that is oncology, because there's a great contribution that you can make as a pharmacist. So I'll, uh, I'll normally attend the clinic, so I'm, I mainly focus Nowadays, I mainly mean focus on pediatric oncology. The other time I used to do both, but now I just focus on pediatric. So I'll attend a clinic. Mm -hmm. So in the clinic, you'll normally have patients who are on follow up who've been treated. Mm -hmm. uh, they are okay. So we just need to follow up and see that they're doing well. Mm -hmm. And there are those who are still on treatment. So they get their treatment as well patients. Mm -hmm. And there are those who get. The treatment as inpatients, but within specific time periods. So they get treatment in the hospital, they go home, then they come back again after a period of time. Mm -hmm. So in the clinic, we'll basically, I'll, I'll basically focus on uh, those that are currently going on on treatment, and this is chemotherapy treatment. Mm -hmm. So we'll review their treatments and uh, see what adverse effects they may be having. And from there, make any interventions that would be necessary. Uh, you look at, for example, if, if the patients are on oral medicines, we try to ensure that they're taking this as required. And also that the parents are keeping the medicines well. You don't want, for example, if a parent has a few children and one of them has a malignancy, mm -hmm. the other children are uh, playing with those medicines or are taking those medicines. Mm. And we want to make sure that they are handled correctly and safely because mm. the medicines are toxic mm. and that the patients are actually taking these medicines uh, well and correctly. So we look at any adverse effects. There are those that are expected. There are some which you may not expect. So we'll just try and see what the patient will be having and then make any intervention that would be necessary for uh for for them then there are those then of course you also look at the scheduling so are they taking when they're supposed to take so for example someone's supposed to take a medicine weekly are they taking them weekly or they have messed up that uh that schedule there are those who will take the medicines as our patients so every medicine is our patient so we just plan them for those then those will be admitted for a cycle of chemotherapy, which requires inpatient treatment. So especially those who are uh, on several uh, infusion medicines, so these ones will take a bit of a while. Mm. So the all infusions, once they've run, will take more than uh, six hours, then you want to admit them mm. so that they can get the infusion in the, infusions in the ward. Then after that, they can go back home after at least they're well, they've been assessed and they, uh, they can go home. There are those who, who get on multiple days. So for example, they get Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Mm -hmm. So you also need to plan for uh, plan for this. So one, we look at the status of the patient, basically the score. Are they well enough? Mm -hmm. Uh, do, they, are they, do they have a favorite illness or any other illness? Uh, are they hydrated well? Have they been feeding? So we need to know whether their score is yeah. good enough to allow them to, to get chemotherapy. Look at their, uh, their blood parameters. So mm -hmm. we need to know whether they are... Mainly we look at the neutrophils, we look at the hemoglobin, and in some cases we look at the platelets. You look at the kidney function and in some cases also the hepatic function. So we need to make sure all these uh, particular aspects are uh, okay before. 
they can uh, they can commence treatment and you look at all these parameters depending on the malignancy so for example a patient with an acute leukemia will uh, assess them differently differently to a patient who has for example a rhabdomyosarcoma or maybe something like a wind tumor for example oh okay so we'll uh, as we'll look at all these parameters uh, differently. So you may find, for example, the full hemogram of a patient with leukemia is very different from the one that for a patient that has maybe a sarcoma before they get the chemo. And we one, we may see the hemogram looks poor, but we allow them to get chemotherapy. The other one, may even better, but we still don't allow them. We want, want it to be improved because of, of the different, uh, the, the because of the different malignancies. So depending on the disease, on the uh, clinical state, on the score of the patient, and on all these lab parameters, then we're able to decide what chemotherapy, uh, whether this patient can get the chemotherapy or not. Then if they aren't able to get return, the scores, mm -hmm. and, uh, and all these other parameters so that now they can be ready to to commence their, um, their, their chemotherapy. Yeah. So in terms of uh, adverse effects, mm. so there are those that we normally expect, like nausea and vomiting, you would expect them to get some uh, bone marrow suppression. Mm. So, uh, so something like nausea and vomiting, we try and prevent it from happening. Okay. So we need to make sure that the patient gets adequate Anti-emetic support according to the chemotherapy regimen that they are getting. So some chemotherapy regimens have very high metrogenic potentials, mm. and so you need to ensure that what they get is good to handle that kind of chemotherapy. Some their chemotherapy has very low metrogenic potential, so for those, in some cases you may even choose not to give any anti-emetic, mm. or you can just give a mild anti-emetic for, for the same. So looking at case by case. Uh, and according to the chemotherapy the patient is getting, then you're able to decide. Some of the adverse effects, you wait for them to happen, then you, you manage them. Like manage. one more suppression. Uh, for example, if a patient develops neuropathies, mm. or if they have diarrhea, then this you wait for them to happen mm. before you now you can you can uh, you can handle yeah. them. So mm. In a nutshell, that uh, those are what we normally do. In uh, some other situations where it gets complicated, then you may have so a patient has received treatment, you've treated for a particular disease. Mm. Maybe the treatment has failed, or you treated the patient got better than after a while, the disease came back. Mm. Then now you have to sit down as a team and decide okay, so what do we do for this patient? Uh, can we? give a particular second line treatment. And if you're giving a second line treatment, what will be the best choice for, for this particular person? Mm -hmm. So for that, of course, it requires uh, you, you to have had a good experience. And of course, as mm -hmm. years go by, you are reading and you're updating information so that you know, okay, for this type of disease, if you're doing a second line, mm -hmm. what will be better for this case? What will be better for, for this other case? Alternative, yeah. Okay. So basically, in a nutshell, that is what uh, that is what we would uh, do in terms of uh, clinical pharmacy, in terms of seeing the patients at the clinic and even at the wards when you're doing the the rounds. Okay. So actually, from that explanation of what you do, there are multiple touch points actually that they have looked at. One, there's the personalized care aspect. You'd find different patients will be managed differently depending on their different scores and different cancers that they're suffering from. And that kind of specialized care, I think to a greater extent, would be dependent by the specialization that somebody pursues in, in terms of the cancer management. So as a pharmacist, as a specialist, you talked about moving from the general care, but also now focusing on pediatric care. Do we have sub-specialization in oncology care for pharmacists and especially the young pharmacists can pursue? That would be one bit. But then the other thing is in terms of adverse events management and also looking at the reporting mechanisms. Are these being reported and how are we improving in terms of managing the toxicities associated with cancer? 
Okay, let's discuss about uh, the adverse the adverse effects. So we want to one differentiate between adverse events and adverse drug reactions. Because in terms of side effects, with any drug, you would expect a side effect. So these are the just the common things. For example, just getting a nausea because of a uh, chemotherapy agent. So for example, if you take something like chlorpheniramine, she can get drowsy. So these are the side effects you expect from your, your medicines. And when you talk of just your general, the general side effects, uh, it's important to record them. And normally they would be recorded in the patient file. Mm -hmm. I know our recording is still not uh, as as what 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 we want them to be, but it's still it's still poor. We want more recording of these things, mm -hmm. but it's still poor though. Because I think because of the workload, people mm -hmm. just try their best, but it's still not as as uh, good as it wanted to be. Yeah. Now, in terms of adverse drug reactions, so these are some of, so, so these ones are nauseous, mm. they are unexpected, and they can be life-threatening in some cases. So the adverse drug reactions. Mm. So these ones also do occur. And uh, when, when we're talking about oncology, we talk a lot about hypersensitivity reactions. Uh, infusion related hypersensitivity re uh, reactions, especially. Mm -hmm. So, in terms of reporting this again, I'll, uh, it's still a challenge. Still a challenge for us because we are not doing very well, mm -hmm. and we still we we'll need to, to to improve on the same. Sometimes work gets too much, so we're not able to report. But we, at least for the few that we're able to, we actually note them and we. And we okay. report them, but the others that happen, you'll probably be informed about it maybe a week or two weeks or three weeks afterwards. Because normally, mm -hmm. what like personally, what I'll do once we've done all the reviews and we've uh, reviewed all the patients, all the treatments, then I give to a, a, another team now for preparation. Mm -hmm. So the medicines will be prepared. Then now they'll be taken for administration. Yeah. So the medicine can be administered, for example, tomorrow. Now, if I did the work today and the medicine was prepared tomorrow and administered not tomorrow, I wouldn't be there. So someone on my for me like the following week, well, this patient had in now in the in the around next week, well, this patient had developed this and and this. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a, it has already happened now in the middle of that world round, because you are still reviewing many other patients, then it becomes hard to to take note of that and and go and uh, and uh, and now do the reporting on the portal, on the B portal, and so you may get like three or four cases. So some days you may remember actually after you finish the portal to go and do it. Some days you may not actually remember. So unfortunately, there we still have a challenge, and I guess it's because of the workload. Because mm -hmm. uh, for example, in in pediatric oncology, I have to remove Mm. Um, we love to like when you do a ward round, we love to see like how many patients, something like 40 patients. Mm. So, for example, if you're told at the 10th patient that this patient developed an adverse drug reaction last week mm. and you still have 30 more to go, mm. then by the end of that 30, uh, it's one o'clock, you're tired, it may be difficult to remember. Okay. So we still have a problem in terms of because of the workload. So we still have a challenge in, in that area, and that is something we've been trying to improve. Though yeah. because of the staff shortage, then uh, we are still a little bit hamstrung. But yeah. I'm hoping moving forward we'll be able to refine this system mm -hmm. so that we'll uh, we can have uh, a way of just collecting all these events and. Putting them, uh, putting them in the portal so that all these things can be uh, can be recorded. So reporting of adverse drug reactions is still a challenge in our, in our setting, mm. and 
Actually, last week I had a discussion with the part of the university, so they will send some students to us to help us in actually collecting this data and uh, and putting in the portal. So I'm hoping that will will improve our our recording of the adverse drug reactions because we need to do it. But because of the heavy workload, then it it remains it remains a, a big challenge. So we you know like for example, in, uh, there was a time I was. I went to do a training in uh, in the US in uh, pediatric oncology. Mm. So as I begin to talk about specialization, so I remember they had two pharmacies, so now we used to do the clinical work for pediatric oncology. It's actually just a children's hospital. Mm. And uh, the number of patients we'd see were like, say 10. 10, they'd never go beyond 14. And so you'd do a round like every day. Mm -hmm. And now you'd review the patients and uh, get to see how they're treating and all these things. Mm -hmm. But you wouldn't go beyond, I don't remember ever going beyond 14, 14 patients. So for them, like the two pharmacies would handle about, about 14, 14 patients. And there you when you when uh, you're the clinical pharmacist, that's your only job. Mm. You're not you're not having any other administrative duties or this and other other duties. So so you just focus there. You focus on your 14 patients. Mm. So you're able to give them maximum maximum attention. And uh, if it's about reading around, you're able to read. If it's about reporting, it is a bit easy because you don't have too many patients. Mm. Because we'd go for the for the round uh, with the pharmacy with the pharmacist there, mm. and so this time of discussion, so you'd say this patient, this patient, so you come to this one, then okay, they they did have this reaction, so you you would have time to actually mm. uh, put in Do that uh, that report. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So for me, for example, well, on Tuesday is when I mostly have that time for uh, is when I know I reserve that time for doing the, the report. The for the world. So it started around nine, we'd finish at about one o'clock after you've seen 40 something patients. And then now there's still many other things to do. There are several other things to do. There are students to supervise, there are students to write, there are still things to do. So it's a bit, it gets a bit tough because of the new workload. workload now yeah. currently, Yeah, current in terms of numbers, uh, there's myself who does the clinical work. There's a colleague of mine who will do a little bit of clinical and some of some of the pharmacy work. I'll do clinical and I'll do a bit of the administrative work because, as in just administrative work of the hospital, I still do a bit of that. So we try and share the work so that at least. Uh, we're able to cover most of it. And you also have to do some of adult oncology mm -hmm. work. So the workload is a bit too much compared to the other, if you go to the Western countries and see what they do. Now, mm -hmm. in terms of specializations, currently we, our system, our system is, hasn't established specializations per se. So you can specialize in terms of uh, what you do and how you work. But in terms of recognition, because specialties normally is about word recognition. Currently, we have currently the board recognizes specialties, mm -hmm. but we don't we haven't come to that place where, for example, you can have pediatric oncology pharmacist or just uh, adult oncology pharmacist, or but you can have the specialty of oncology pharmacist. Now, in terms of uh, training, you don't have that training because you know the training will help you get that mm -hmm. specialization. specialization yeah. And so, currently, there's no specific oncology pharmacy training. Mm -hmm. I know Kabarak University wants to begin mm -hmm. a master's in oncology pharmacy. Um, hopefully, by we begin, but as we speak. Currently, you don't just have clinical pharmacy at the University of Nairobi, and then you can do a minor 
minor in, in oncology pharmacy. So the minor you spend a small amount of time. So you may not be able to gain, you may not be able to gain the skills that are required of you to be able to yeah. uh, do proper uh, oncology pharmacy work. Okay. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. And I think those are actually some of the pointers on where there's room for improvement. I think there's that aspect in terms of workload being substantial. Therefore, there's an opportunity to get more pharmacists in oncology space and especially looking at employment for more people to ensure that that workload is managed. Then the other bit is in terms of now training and ensuring their specialization. And hopefully with Kabarak, the oncology pharmacy training, that would be a plus in terms of driving that growth. So those are critical aspects that you've shared as well. So when I look at it in terms of your, pro your profile as a oncology pharmacist and in terms of the work that you've been doing, to a greater extent, you've been leading the growth in terms of the oncology department at Kenyatta National Hospital. What are some of the drivers that you'd say have been enablers for you to be able to make that transformation to contribute to the development of the department? And what are your aspirations in terms of driving the growth in terms of oncology care? Okay, so in, term, in terms of uh, drivers, what has helped is one, okay, and this works both ways, it's just basically the workload. So because in, in if you if you look at when I when I when I when I began working in KNH, which was uh, 2005, the patients we used to see were not many, there were quite few. Say like if I talk about the adult oncology, we'd have um, how many patients? Say it's not more than 15 getting chemo per week in the outpatient. But as the years went by this number grew, and as the number grew, then it's, and we had gone in there and, and uh, had been part of the team, then also the pharmacy bit had to, had to, had to grow. So the increasing workload enabled us to grow. So we took up that challenge in terms of, okay, the clinical oncology said they were now want to have an extra clinic because the number of patients we have one, this and this, and because of that, you have to fit in. And so you try and fit in, but you find the workload is too much. And because you're not able, because you're not able, then uh, it is seen that, okay, pharmacy is letting us down. And so you have to try and just fight and push for, for extra. And with that, then you're able to get extra because it comes to a point where now you don't want to see pharmacy as the one which is bringing the institution down in terms of, and just basically taking up your role and sticking with it. So. Before before I joined KNH, they used to tell me that uh, chemotherapy preparation was done by the nurses. So a colleague of mine, Dr. Weru, when uh, she came in, there was another colleague also, they came in, then they started doing. So this other colleague went to South Africa for some training and saw some, some of the practice over there. And the practice was, it's pharmacists to do there preparation. So when she came back, she decided, okay, even here, the pharmacist should do. And since uh, the oncologists there are actually trained internationally, they agreed. And so she took that up. And now when you took it up, when it was taken up by pharmacy, we couldn't let it back, go back to the nursing again. And so as patients grew, became many then, what had to happen is that the number of pharmacists had to Yes. Had to had to increase, and with that we had to try and uh, get more in terms of facilities. Like uh, when I joined, we didn't have a particular like a, like a pharmacy just dedicated for oncology, so that was developed. And then moving ahead, we and as we continued learning, so as you know, as years go by, you get experience and we also gain more knowledge. We have to start thinking about safety because when you go for a conference. International conference, that is what they talk about, safety in material preparation. And so we have to bring the same locally. And so 
again, start pushing for, for equipment that will allow for safe compounding of, of chemotherapy. And so we started getting the equipment. So as we continued, we began getting more stuff, getting more equipment. And uh, so compared to the time I joined, where now we were just two pharmacists, and we did have an oncology pharmacy. So we used to operate from, it's called main, the main pharmacy, Pharmacy 40, which now uh, basically just handles all, it's just like a best, like a general inpatient pharmacy. So currently we have two oncology pharmacies, one for inpatient, one for outpatient. Uh, then we are two pharmacies. So right now the number of pharmacies are, uh, how many we are? There are like six pharmacists. Then there are also some technologists. There are how many? There are four technologists. And of course, now we'll get interns and the master students. So now the team is grown, it's much bigger. And you are a big part of the decision making in terms of, of, of oncology. So basically, in most of oncology, no prescription. Can be can be served without a pharmacist reviewing it. There has to be a pharmacist for us to review that prescription, review the patient, for it to go to the next step of whether this patient will actually get the medicines or not get the medicines. You see, at, at some point in time before that, some prescriptions will just be written and the medicine will be prepared, the patient will get. But right now, at least a pharmacist has to has to look at that prescription and verify. Before the, before the chemotherapy has been, is actually you now dispensed the patient, whether as in IV form for administration or even, or even oral form. One of the things that has also helped us is um, if you look at, at the, some years ago, they started a radiation and clinical oncology program, masters. That's for the for the doctors there at KNH. And so the coordinator, that the course coordinator is actually a friend of mine who was uh, worked with him when he was still a medical officer then in Kenyatta, then he went to do his studies. And then now he came back, so he was asked to begin a program. So he asked me not to be part of, of the faculty. But now that is just for the first years, because now that is when they do the pharmacology. So I teach them about the, the pharmacology. And, and now with this, it helps, it enables the doctors now gain respect for, for the pharmacists, because they know it's a pharmacist to taught us some of these things. And so when they go out, they're able to recognize the role of a pharmacist. And so for whatever medicine issues they have, they'll know it's only a pharmacist to can. Who can sort? So that one is in green from the training. In them, at least in their training, which which now actually helps the, the cause of the pharmacist. This um I'm, I'm, I'm part of, of a society called International Society of Oncology Pharmacist Practitioners. So it's just basically it's a global society of oncology pharmacists. Now, one of the members there in uh, he works in, in Canada. It's a place called McMaster University. Now he's uh he's actually he's a pharmacist, but he's actually a lecturer in pediatrics in that university. See the way, for example, here in the University of Nairobi, in pediatrics department, all the lecturers are basically pediatricians. They could be pediatricians, maybe with a hundred masters of public health or whatever it is, but they're all pediatricians. But there. Where he is, okay, they're pediatricians, but he's also a pharmacist who is part of that. Yeah, faculty. And so, yeah, of that faculty. So all the the poor who become pediatricians, who are becoming pediatric oncologists, coming out of that university well, will come out having that respect for the, for, the for the pharmacist because they know it's a yeah, pharmacist on the faculty and he's the one who's given them some of uh, the knowledge that uh, that they have. And I think that is a gap 
maybe if in the in the in the past they were, they would have been able to like for example if they had strengthened strengthen very much the, the pharmacology department at the University of Nairobi such that even the doctors would be taught the pharmacology by the pharmacists rather than uh, their doctors then I think we would develop this kind of relationship so that now they would have this respect for pharmacology just just for the pharmacy. So some of these things have actually helped us. And the reason why this guy asked me to do it is because uh, we worked together during that, that was there from around 2008, 2009, then I went to school, then I came back. So, and I used to help him a lot with the, with the, with the chemotherapy. So we just decided, okay, since we are doing this and anyway, the University of Nairobi didn't have money not to employ new lecturers, so you just have to get the colleagues that you know be part of your faculty. So you know, like for me, who was working at KNH, and I teach at University of Nairobi, I'm not paid by the University of Nairobi, so it's more like I guess an adjunct factor of the faculty. But I still do it because I know it will help our cause as pharmacists by just being there. Thank you, thank you for that. And actually, those are some critical aspects that you're looking at in terms of the training. Are we involved in the training? And that will even inform the kind of curriculum that we're developing. Because if the curriculum is informed by a pharmacy, you understand the technicalities and the nitty gritties, which is critical. But then the other thing that you've talked about is the level of exposure. Because when you're going out to the US, for example, when you're seeing what's happening in those spaces, those are learnings that you're coming back to contextualize. So based on those kind of attributes and those kind of experiences, including the conferences and even the society that you're part of, what would be your advice to young professionals in terms of getting exposed to the new possibilities and how do they go about that? Okay, um, I, was, I was fortunate, uh, you know, right now the economy, as, as you can see, the economy of Kenya is uh, not doing very well and so, we are hearing most servants were not being paid, so it's a bit hard. But I was fortunate that at uh, there was a point where at least there was money for for these kinds of training, one, and uh, if maybe if the hospital didn't have money, they they. Uh, this traveled. So for other pharmacists, you, uh, one, uh, if you can come to a place that is already uh, like a center of excellence around. So if you can come to even, let's not even just focus on oncology, let's focus, let's look at other areas. So for example, if it's critical care, if it's a uh, renal pharmacy, if it's oncology, whatever it is, you can go to a center of excellence. If you can just um, maybe just go to KU, go to MPSHA and see what they are doing. If you can get now exposed to some of these areas in, in whatever in whatever field, in whatever specialty, in whatever subspecialty. Mm. If you can come, then that one would, would always be an additional knowledge. It will always be an additional help. If you can come to KNH, be so whether you're still doing whether you're in uh, in school or you're looking for more school. If you can go to whichever centre it is and uh, try and learn and see what these pharmacists are doing, MTRH is a, also a nice place for clinical pharmacy. There are lots of things they are uh, they are doing. There are many partnerships they uh, they have. So we just go and inquire and. Uh, just look and ask, uh, how can I get an opportunity to learn more? How can I get an opportunity to get more exposure? Just ask those who are ahead of you, those who are already working, and see what opportunities are um, are, uh, are out there. You see, if you ask me from the top of my head, right now I may not be able to say we can get this or you can get that. Mm. But if so, for example, one of the... M from students ask me, I need, I'd like to get an exposure here or an exposure at this place. What do you think I, I, I can do? Do you know of something I can uh, try and look and uh, see like, for example, like I said, I'm part of the International Society of Oncology Pharmacists. 
I can ask some of those pharmacists who are working in different countries, uh, mm -hmm. do they have any opportunities? Do they have any openings? Mm -hmm. There are some of our colleagues we worked with who are working in other countries. We can ask them, do you have any opportunities, any openings? What would it require? Mm -hmm. And you can look, you can just try and, uh, and just by looking around and by asking, you never know what can happen. Something can just, Something can just come up and someone could actually be having an opportunity and say, okay, yes, I have this opportunity. Someone can come here maybe for a month, for six months, for whatever it is, for a whole fellowship program and get to learn uh, this particular subject. So just by going and showing an interest and um, just asking those questions, then there could actually be a door open. So see, right now, since I am not looking for, for anything, then I don't know. Yeah. But if someone will ask me and uh, tell me, need, I'd like to have this and this, I would go out of my way and yeah. and ask people and colleagues out there. And if something comes up, they would, yeah. would actually inform them and share the opportunity. So keep looking, keep seeking. Um, for those that read the Bible, the Bible says, ask. Seek and knock. No, okay. Thank you. Thank you for that. And it's about tapping into the available opportunities because I believe actually, personally, I, I still have some memory of the work that I used to do with you in Conpology when I was doing my internship. And it's valuable even beyond practicing as a regulatory affairs professional where I'm practicing. So I think it's about tapping into the available opportunities, mm -hmm. learning and asking those questions because at the end of the day, you never know where you're going mm -hmm. to use that information and what opportunities could present themselves as well. So that is a very critical mm. thing. Yeah. And then based on your practice and actually one key thing that is a constant within the space is one, the burden of cancers is increasing every other day. And that is a problem that we have to contend with. So with that, what are some of the trends that you're seeing that can actually revolutionize and improve in care? And with those, how would the young pharmacies position themselves to learn more about these emerging trends and to take up the challenge? Okay, in terms of uh, opportunities that, that are coming, okay, they, they are one day is, if you go to the West, you'll find like say, every two weeks, every month, there's a new oncology drug coming out. Every month, there's a new oncology drug coming out. Yeah. Now, one is that most of these things, when they come to the market, they'll be very expensive. Secondly, some of these medicines, you uh, the benefit may not be as market as you would hope, or some would actually have a market effect. Thirdly, some of these uh, medicines, remember, they have to undergo the new medicines have to have. There has to have been a clinical trial that was done for the medicine to have been approved. Mm -hmm. So the clinical trial is uh, done on what let's call them perfect patients. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily real world patients. Mm -hmm. And then they are normally done in the West. So mainly in the Caucasian population, mm -hmm. hardly in the African population. So our opportunities that will be there is one, Looking at the response, just the, the, the difference in genetics and the response to this medicine. So will the medicines act the same mm -hmm. in our patients compared to the Caucasian? Yeah. So that is one in terms of, of uh, just we can basically the genetics and the bio biology, the differences in biology. Mm -hmm. The other one is looking at the socioeconomic aspects mm -hmm. and you will find uh, there are a number of organizations which do what are called uh, access programs. Mm -hmm. And so, for example, if something can actually have a good benefit, can we have an access program? So these are things which you actually have to, uh, people have to fight, try and uh, maybe just try and do a proposal and see whether the thing can go through mm -hmm. and look at various funders. And so you may just get lucky and get some funder for the same and you can roll out your um, access program. Uh, your your access uh, program. Something else that I I see people are looking at is can we do clinical trials in in Africa? So 
Africa, for many reasons, you are not able to do clinical trials because clinical trials require you to have, have something set up. Mm -hmm. Because you used to have some, some basis for the same. So if you're able to try and uh, 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 get these things, be it in a hospital or whatever, then you can have a company come in and actually do a clinical trial over here. And when they come to the clinical trial, it comes with uh, with cash. Yeah. And uh, if you're able to have many medicines available, then uh, knowing what these medicines can do require more pharmacists because one pharmacist knowing all these medicines is really difficult. Mm -hmm. If you go to the bigger hospitals in the US, uh, the, the time I was there, uh, there's someone who used to tell me there's a joke that goes on that in uh, there's a hospital called MD Anderson, mm -hmm. Cancer Hospital in Texas. They used to say, they used to have a joke that in that hospital, there's a pharmacist who treats HR2 positive breast cancer only. So basically, your job is treating, is just looking at breast cancer patients, and not all breast cancer patients, mm -hmm. those who have a certain specific marker, who have a certain cell marker. So yeah. not all of them, just a certain cell marker. Mm -hmm. So you can see with that, because of all those differences, and you know, like in breast cancer, you have those who are HR2 positive only. Mm -hmm. Then this was a GR2 positive, ER2 positive, PR positive, mm -hmm. and those were multiple positive. Yeah. So you can guess like there are four different pharmacies just for all the patients, okay. just handling breast cancer patients. Mm -hmm. And each has its own has its own particular subset. So they don't know what is going on in that other, in that other domain, yeah. In that other subset, they just know what is going on in their in their subset. So as things get more complicated. Then it's time for pharmacists to also uh, begin uh, just trying to look at all this, all these new drugs. Mm -hmm. Is there anything? Are there anything? Um, are there anything specific that we can uh, handle, which maybe not these other oncologists may not be able to know? Mm -hmm. You, 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 you we, we are seeing. Like for example, the pharmacy is growing. Okay, though that one is um, the scope is not very wide. Mm -hmm. uh, the other day, the Rubias Hospital began a bone marrow transplant program. We're hoping that no public hospitals will begin. Once that happens in public hospitals, mm -hmm. then it will open doors for uh, for pharmacists to so come in mm -hmm. in terms of just handling bone marrow mm -hmm. uh, bone marrow transplant. So. And of course, as oncology grows, the number of institutions that uh, will want to do oh, chemotherapy will also grow. Mm. And of course, they will need pharmacists. Yeah. And we are trying to work with the National Cancer Institute to ensure that for all chemotherapy centers, they, they should be a pharmacist and not, yeah. Mm. Okay. So that's great, actually. When I look at it, those are possibilities. And one of the key things that I actually just remember from what you've shared that I believe is going to be a key game changer, especially from our context, is the access programs. Because actually, even in the morning today, I got somebody contacting me from Kiricho that they have a patient admitted in a hospital, but the medication that are needed are not there. And in some of the cases, even affordability would be an issue. So how do we ensure that these products are accessible? And those are critical bits that I think as pharmacists, when you check them up, We'll be able to open up the space, mm -hmm. create more value for pharmacies, but also improve the care delivery where we're working. So that's a critical contribution. So thank you so much for that. So as we come mm -hmm. towards the end, tail end of this discussion, for me, what would be key is, as Dr. Wata, in terms of your personal life beyond oncology pharmacy, what are some of the key enablers for your successes and what are the key things that you're actually pursuing and doing beyond pharmacy? Okay, yes, so first, first, I just need to have that work ethic. You need to, you need to have that work ethic. Because uh, I work with interns and uh, the M farms, mm -hmm. and even just the B farms were in the 50s, yes. Mm -hmm. And 
they always get shocked when I ask them questions about biochemistry and uh, physiology, the things which they did in first year. But you really need to have your stuff in order. You really need to have your understanding all the way from the basics mm. up till to the top. So you understand your basics well, your physiology well, your biochemistry, you need to understand it very well. Mm. So don't be afraid to go back to that biochemistry book and read and refresh, or to that physiology book and read and refresh. Don't be afraid to go and look and just see what was this whole thing all about? How is it related to the things that I'm seeing now or the things that I learned in fourth year and fifth year? Mm. It's important to have your basics and to have them, mm. to have them very well. Uh, I can't overstress. I can't overstress that it's really important, especially in the chemical pharmacy space. It's, it's very crucial. You need to have your chemistry. You need to have your medical yeah. physiology on point. Yeah. And now, you're, beyond that, now you need to keep be keep updated in what is is new. So, like, I still have some of my books, some of my reference books. So. And I'm not ashamed to go back and say, look at a basic drug like cyclophosphamide mm -hmm. and see, does it have this particular side effect? Does it have this particular side effect? Can you administer it this way? Mm -hmm. uh, can you store it this way? As in, so that is a... that is how you improve your, your knowledge and so that when you when you go for that word round and there is a concern, there's a question, you're always able to handle it as the pharmacist. Mm -hmm. And as uh, time goes by, people now begin to trust you and to, uh, to take you as a point of, of knowledge. I remember my first initial days in oncology, I would be asked a question and, and a question basically just, just about a drug. Mm. What you'd consider a simple question about a drug, and I would struggle in my head. Okay, what, what is that? As in, I realized in my first days, I realized I don't know anything at all, and so I realized I needed to be reading and reading every now and then. So I'd make sure I go for that word round. So whatever question I get or whatever thing I see, then I go back and read, and that was the practice. I see whatever I see, whatever question I get, I go and check. That was the general practice. Whatever I see. Whatever question is asked, go and check. And that was the regular practice, that daily practice, until you get a handle of, of the subject matter that is that is uh, before you. Without mm. that, you will the one or one, one you will be very blank. Mm. And uh, secondly, whatever information or whatever whatever um, let's call them myths mm. that just come in, you easily believe. But so long as you are you have your basics and you're always going back to your books, then if something comes up, if someone comes up with all these funny forwards from WhatsApp and some funny things you see in the internet, yeah. you'll be able to put a proper thought process on it mm. and be able to either say, okay, this is it, or it's a half truth, or it's 70% truth, 30% lie, or 30% truth, 70%. 70% lie, but you'll be able to actually just have your facts and have them well outlined. Yeah. So it's important to have your basics and to always go back and read. Mm. The other thing, uh, like uh, I had mentioned, is just trying to get exposure whatever, uh, wherever it is. Mm. Uh, like, for example, that I joined the International Society of Pharmacists Practitioners, that one actually opened a whole, uh, a whole door of education and knowledge for myself. I, I, I would know, okay, yeah, mm. people are doing this, people are doing that, so how am I supposed to be doing things mm. uh, here, here mm. where I'm working? And the other thing is that never fear working, never fear workloads. Mm. That workload is actually what helps you to grow. So never fear that workload. You know, in government, we generally don't like workload. You want to have an easy life, 
uh, you want maybe to work one day and Skype the other day, you want to come to work at nine and you've left by lunchtime, but don't fear that work. Take up that work, do that work. The more you work, the more people start depending on you, the more people start depending on you, the more they come to you as the pharmacist. Mm. And now the more they come to you, the more you're able to open and even open opportunities for other of your other of your of your colleagues. Mm. So don't again don't fear just continue grinding that work. Uh, Again, I'll go back to the Bible, uh, which says those who sow in tears mm -hmm. will, will reap, reap in, in joy. joy. Will reap in joy. So don't fear, because uh, I look back from where I've come from. There were days when I used to come, I remember I used to come to work at around quarter to seven, because mm -hmm. I needed to start doing chemotherapy preps and have them ready by nine o'clock so that mm. I can attend a ward round which is at, which is beginning at nine o'clock. Mm. I remember those years when uh, when I used to do that. And um, you see, with that, with that, two people depended on me, and because of that, we've been able to open doors for other pharmacists to to come in. So do not fear work. Uh, if I can give another example. Now from the negative side, in uh, in Kenech, for the longest time we had, you know, we do this extemporaneous preparations, mixing syrup for tablets for children especially. Mm -hmm. So for the longest time, the person who used to do it was a pharmacist assistant, not a pharmacist or a farm tech. It's actually embarrassing, but mm -hmm. it, it did happen. No one took that role up. Mm -hmm. No one wanted to do it. And so there was this assistant who just used to do it. Because I think that after seeing some people, uh, he, was, he was there for a long time. So after seeing people do it, he just got in the process of doing it and just used to do it. Mm. And so nobody used to care about it. Now, until the day he retired. Now, when he retired, now we had a pharmacist now who, who started doing it. Mm. And when she took up that role, we realized now actually that we've actually wasted so many years because mm. if we started doing that a long time ago, mm. we'd have such a big impact. Mm. We probably would have, would have hired a couple of pharmacists those days. Mm. In fact, those days when government had money, yeah. rather than right now when it's struggling with money, and yeah. we'd, have be, we'd be having maybe a couple of pharmacists over there who would mm. be doing that work and even much, much more. Mm. And they would have uh, well, there's some research we're trying to do there, so they would have done some research and done some validation, mm. and we'd actually be ahead in in this thing. But because of that time we wasted, no pharmacist wanted to take that thing up. Mm. For me, it's like wasted years, wasted opportunities because mm. people did not want to take up that role. No one wanted to work. No one wanted. We just threw it away, and because of that, mm. opportunities were. Were, were wasted, were basically wasted. So don't fear doing any hard work. Don't fear working hard. Just, just take it, but knowing that in the end you have your your goal. So you just need to know what your goal is, what your aim is, what your objective is, so that when you work, you're working towards particular goal. that particular Yeah. And uh, uh, maybe as finally, I can just say... Uh, my spiritual life. So I'm a, I'm a born again Christian. I'm a believer in Jesus Christ. And so my faith in God helps me do my work, gives me the compassion that I need, and just helps me to, to focus and see the end from, from where I am. So that uh, whenever I go to work and sometimes I'm discouraged and I, I, I know where I, to whom I can turn to, where I can turn to, and I can continue going on, knowing that there is something there at the end of the tunnel. Mm. Thank you. Thank you for that. And having that kind of grounding on your faith and the focus on the values that you're talking about, work ethic is critical, committing to doing the actual work that needs to be done rather than letting go of the opportunities, because some of the ones that you've talked about, those are wasted opportunities. 
probably would be having a very big extemporaneous pharmacy actually at KNH now at the moment. Hopefully, we'll never lose that track mm -hmm. again. Yeah. Then based on mm -hmm. all that that you've shared, when you look back on your life and some of the opportunities that you've had, some of the opportunities that you've gotten and some of the those that you've missed, what are, if you had a chance to change one thing, is there anything that you'd want to change? Hello? Oh, sorry. Yes, I can hear you now. Yeah, so there was a time uh, we, when I had an opportunity to actually go to the UK for, for a whole year mm -hmm. just to do oncology pharmacy, but there were a number of issues going on. I was, I was in school at that point, and uh, I was doing my master's at that point. Mm -hmm. And so they, and so there was a task in terms of, okay, they insisted, no, you must do your second year in Kenya, you can't go and meet in UK. And I thought, okay, um, let me just stay because anyway, uh, so that I just finish my, my second year. Nice. <laughs> Now it, it so happened that I didn't manage to finish my second year at that time, so I had to Before. graduate now the following year. Mm -hmm. So I thought I should have just gone anyway mm -hmm. instead of instead of, the uh, instead of worrying because it was going to happen anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, completing a year extra than uh, what was intended. Mm -hmm. Then uh, there, there were a few times we were not able to be very diligent in terms of, of, of selecting some of our, of our equipment. And so we didn't get quite the right equipment. And so I think I should have just sought, sought um, clarification from some, some of my colleagues in the international space, mm. ask them what, what do you require for ABCD? Mm. But at that point, I didn't just went ahead and got the wrong thing, then we realized it afterwards. So, so I've met a couple of, uh, of, of, of those kinds of, of mistakes, but anyway, we learned from, uh, from our mistakes. Now it's just to improve uh, in the future. Great, great. Thank you for that. And if I'd ask, the last question for me would be, as Dr. Water, what is success to you? Because I believe everybody is looking at being successful in whatever they're doing. People see you and see you're successful. So as a personal level, what is that success? You know, for me, success is just uh, achieving objectives. So as so long as I've, I've set some objectives mm -hmm. and I meet those objectives, for, for me, I, I can say that is success. OK. Thank, mm, thank you. Simple, yeah. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for this, being part of this discussion. And I'm hoping that the listeners who will listen into it will actually learn from it and be better professionals. Because at the end of the day, it's our responsibility to shape the future of the profession and also make our contribution to the well being of humanity. So, Asante Sana. Any last remarks? Over to you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, just uh, thank you for the, for the initiative. I, I think that this is something that has been. Uh, has been lacking that kind of this kind of, of, of mentoring. And it's important for those of us who, who've gone ahead to be able to, to support and, and guide those of us who are uh, just beginning in, uh, in the profession. Mm -hmm. And so what I can just say is that uh, my, my office is open. Uh, as you know, I'm in KNH. If you come to KNH, just go to any pharmacy and ask where can I find Dr. Water and the uh, then uh, I'm I'm ready and willing to just help pharmacists grow and just make that step. Mm -hmm. And I believe if we help one another in this way, we'll uh, enable other people and just generate the profession to to grow. This is something we didn't have much in our days, but I'm hoping maybe with this program and even with other programs, we can be able to just help 
at least those of us who have uh, go who, who have come out before in whatever mm -hmm. area it is be it clinical be it industrial be it in business whatever mm -hmm. area it is we can help the young pharmacists just take that step and also move forward to chart their their own way so that even then they can help those who are coming behind the direction them. after mm -hmm. Perfect. Thank you so much. It's our responsibility. So I really appreciate you taking your time and we we'll hope we'll keep learning and keep working on this. Asante sana. Okay. Thank you very much.